Thank you for that introduction, Filippo. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back in Vienna. It, it was my home for six years, and um, only, I only recently, last fall, uh, finished our second project. So it's really nice to be back amongst old friends and new friends and all of you. Um, I really want to, uh, I know everybody's thanked the Sadra Foundation and, and the department here at the University of Vienna. Um, but I, I just want to reiterate how fortunate it is that we all have the chance to meet here, thanks to Klaus and the whole department, uh, Ava and Alexander, for all the work they've done to make this possible, and to Marcus for, and the rest of the Sadra Foundation for uh, enabling us to all get together for this very interesting um, symposium. Uh, I'm already uh, uh, from the, the previous presenters today, I'm already quite excited about how it's going. I, I, I think that uh, we already have a sense of what a complex and heterogeneous idea Buddha nature is. And I, when, when I began working here in Vienna with, with Martina, we very soon found that Buddha nature kind of functions within Tibetan Buddhism. And, and, and I think in all countries that um, uh, assimilated Buddhism as kind of a keystone concept that locks into place a number of different uh, overlapping views concerning the nature of reality, the nature of mind, the nature of Buddhahood. So it's a really rich topic for trying to understand where any given tradition or thinker, um, what their kind of defining ideas are. Today I'm focusing on a particular strand of the Eighth Karmapa's Buddha Nature writings. It's only a small facet of his work on Buddha Nature, which is almost overwhelming in its uh, depth and complexity. Um, and I'm not just plugging our recent monograph, which is coming out soon, but truly uh, whatever we've tried to capture in there is a small part of uh, his tremendous uh, contribution to this topic. So I'm focusing on uh, a slightly, uh, well, somebody asked me if this is going to be heretical. Maybe it's slightly heretical, the, the idea of uh, what is the relationship between Buddha nature and, and self or selfhood. Because indeed, in some, uh, as Christopher Jones in his recent uh, PhD thesis, which I do want to promote, um, as he sh showed in, in, in that work, and I gather in his forthcoming book based on that, um, we have this early... Uh, very strong equation of Buddha nature with a true self that lies within people as a real, you know, true self that lies there waiting, waiting, awaiting our discovery. So I want to give a sense of how Miki Dorje responds to this idea, not, not through a, a, his ex exegesis or interpretation of the early Buddha nature texts, although he does touch on the Srimala Devi, but rather on uh, Gulutsawa's equation of Buddha nature with a subtle self, which was allegedly made under the tutelage of Tsongkhapa. So, um, before I get too far into my preamble, I'll just start because otherwise time ticks. So, just a provocative couple epigrams. Uh, Miki Dorje in his massive Gongchig commentary, which spans eight volumes of his collected writings says, Buddha nature is authentic selfhood because it, in its selflessness, even conceptual proliferations regarding no self have completely subsided. So this captures attention, we'll find throughout his work that, um, you know, and, and, and just in general, in, uh, if you look at many topics in, in sort of the doctrinal history of Buddhism, you, you find these creative tensions that sort of run through everything, whether it's emptiness and fullness in the sense of sort of Sarvakara uh, Utepa uh, Shunyata, the, the, the emptiness endowed with the most excellent facets, or this idea of self actually being um, something that can be discovered through selflessness. Um, and then I just threw in Paul Ricoeur's fascinating um, comment, is not a moment of self-dispossession of essential to authentic selfhood, because he does kind of, uh, in, in, um, in this book, One Self is Another, he does take up sort of quasi-Buddhist Parfit uh, ideas about, uh, you know, the idea of no self and, and coming from a rich phenomenological hermeneutical tradition, he sees that there is a place for discussion of authentic selfhood once you kind of have abandoned certain ideas of a reified self. So y you do find interesting overlaps. So Miki Dorje's Tathagarbha writings, I'll just use TG throughout this uh, 
for the abbreviation, contains several um, extended discussions on the topic of how Buddha nature relates to different, different ideas of selfhood. Um, and not surprisingly, he brought, broadly rejects uh, critiques of the belief in self um, and any equation between Buddha nature and the self. And these follow standard, uh, often he, uh, of course, follow standard Madhyamaka um, sort of nominalist arguments against the belief in self. On the other hand, however, he does avow an uh, idea of authentic selfhood or transcendent perfection of self, Atma Paramita, found in certain Tathagarbha and Tantric texts. And he very often qualifies this as, as uh, something that's discovered through understanding selflessness. Now, his primary target, as I mentioned, is Gulitzawa's identification of Buddha nature with the subtle self, which uh, Miki Dorje a little bit uh, unkindly unkind <laughs> says was made under the uh, influence of Tsongkhapa. Tsongkhapa is the in, um, idea of a subtle self. So what does Mikirji do with all this? Well, I want to say that, as is typical of him, he's very much a dialectical thinker. Um, we, we've tried to show in our previous two publications that he's not only a dialogical thinker who, um, who uh, explores multiple viewpoints um, that often seem, on the face of it, to, to be contradictory, but he's also dialectical in the sense that he really makes an effort to coordinate and reconcile what appear to be competing or even oppositional viewpoints. So not surprisingly, he comes to view this sort of self, no self, um, aporia uh, as complementary, that ne the negation of self is regarded as a crucial moment in the discovery of authentic selfhood. But what he means by that um, is very much qualified, as we'll see. But this is synonymous with Dharmakaya and resultant Buddha nature. So uh, just a bit of background. So in stark opposition to the central Buddhist teaching that there is no self, but rather a bundle of ever-changing aggregates that we in different ways falsely uh, identify as a self, um, certain early Tathagarbha texts indeed embrace the existence of some permanent essential constituent in beings sometimes identified as a true self. And, and the Mahaparinirvana Mahasutra uh, characterizes the Buddha Datu in, in beings as a true permanent self, something that underlies the flux of, con flux of conditioned existence and undergoes transmigration. It's also sometimes described as a secret teaching that um, requires kind of a strong dose of no self to really understand. So it's, it's hard to imagine a, a doctrine more antithetical to the core Buddhist axiom of, uh, of no self, and so it, um, it's therefore not surprising that it becomes a topic of much debate and controversy in, in the um, centuries to follow. Then we have the Lankavatara Sutra, which identifies Tathagarbha with the self, but says it's a provisional teaching used to attract non-Buddhist Tatma Bhadans. The Srimala Devi Sin Sinananda Sutra and the Ratnagotra Vibhaga and its Vakya uh, admit a conception of true selfhood or transcendent perfection of self. The, the translation I'm using, transcendent perfection of self, we'll see is, is uh, the way Mikya Dorje understands the two senses of paramita. And this is arrived at through understanding the absence of anything erroneously identified as a self. So this strand of Buddha nature doctrine intersects with Buddhist tantric ideas of a supreme self or true nature of self that's also said to be realized through selflessness. So this gives just a bit of background um, to uh, the debate that we'll be looking at. So it's important looking at any Tibetan thinker to sort of try to understand their phil philosophical affiliations to really get a sense of how they will come at any given doctrine. And in the case of Mika Dorje, he's got a, an allegiance to two strands of Madhyamaka, the consequentialist, we can call it, the Telgyurpa, it's a Tibetan invention. Um, and the non-foundationalist Apratistana, uh, Apratistana Vada or Sarva Dharma Apratistana Vada currents. And these two provide him with the tools, as do many um, in the Karmakagyu tradition. They sort of combine the anti-essentialism of the Prasangika with the anti-foundationalism or non-foundationalism of, uh, of the Apratistana Vada uh, in order to reject any ultimate foundation or any shovel-stopping bedrock that you ever come to if you examine 
phenomena. So uh, these lead him, these two strands lead him to reject equating Tathagarbha with the self. On the other hand, his commitment to affirmative Tathagarbha and tantric paradigms, especially his own Mahamudra background, um, lead him to equate Tathagarbha with some type of authentic selfhood via selflessness. So our question is how to reconcile his sort of metaphysical disinclination to identify Buddha nature with the self, and on the other hand, his avowal of authentic selfhood realized through selflessness. And, a, and an important underlying question is what kinds of self are at stake here? So how can he retain a tantric Tathagarbha idea of authentic selfhood without recourse to the nominalist postulate of the self as an independently existing entity rejected by Buddhists of all schools? So the sources that I've consulted for this are um, an early treatise that's got one of my favorite titles, uh, Genpu Lungmen, the nerve tonic for the elderly. And the interesting thing is in uh, his collected write, th this is how it occurs in his own autobiography, but in his collected writings, uh, his uh, um, disciple and, and uh, secretary, Tsugla Trengwa, retitled it as the sublime fragrance of nectar, which is a ridiculous title in its own right. And, and it's, it, this, this title, the original title, really captures the spirit of this work. It's a sustained critique of Gulitzhawath and Shakyachogden's two tantric Buddha nature theories. Um, in other words, their views of the Gugud, the causal continuum, which is basically a tantric proxy for Buddha nature. So I'll just refer to that as the tonic. And the second important source, which uh, Tina and I really found absolutely fascinating, is his last great masterwork, the Kusum Gochu Namshe, another massive commentary. Is it three volumes or four? Well, different editions, but huge. <laughs> um, and he revisits this, the same um, critique of Gulutsawa within the context of a, a, a refutation of five different um, tantric Buddha nature theories of 14th to 15th century masters, Tsongkhapa, Gelsabje, Remdawa, Lama Sonim Gelsen, and Gulutsawa himself. So this work I'll just refer to as the embodiments. Mm -hmm. So the scriptural target of both critiques is Gulitzawa's Gyutsum Sangwa, which is extant in the Podola collection, but frustratingly unavailable to us. We tried different devious means to try to lay our hands on it, but none of them bore any fruits. <laughs> I, won't, I won't go into that. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so the doctrinal target is Gulitzawa's identification of Tathagarbha or Gyugyud with a subtle self, as I mentioned, that was said to be under the influence of Tsongkhapa. So let's just, uh, it's a, I don't like having long quotes, but I, I have to put this one because it forms the basis for Nikidorje's critique. He says, so this is, a, and we can trust, uh, because in his critique of uh, Shakya Chogden, which we do have the text for, uh, his quotations were very reliable. They matched perfectly with the existing version. So we can assume this really was in the Gyutsum Sangwa. He says, regarding, this is Gulitsawa speaking, regarding the so-called self, which is of two kinds, the coarse self and subtle self, it's necessary to posit the extraordinary causal continuum of Montreal in terms of a subtle self as explained in these two tantras, tantric works. The coarse self is construed as nominally existent, an imputation of a self or person, the object of the mind that posits a self or person after objectifying the collection that comprises the skanda and the rest. The subtle self is construed as the ally of jnana, the mind characterized as continually immersed in all states of samsara. And this is precisely the subtle self that's called the true reality or a person who is a Mahapurusha, the Mahapurusha Pudgala. In this regard, even though the causal continuum is in this case posited in terms of a subtle self, it's not like the self of the Nambuddha Sankhya that is explained as having five constituents. Rather, in the Kalachakra Tantra, that self is ascertained as emptiness. And then he goes on to explain that, therefore, it, because the self in this case is ascertained as emptiness, it's not a view of self, but rather it's supreme antidote. So uh, Mikya Dorje sort of takes this apart line by line. And to, before going into his critique, it's important to understand here that there are basically, in the early uh, Tathagarbha works, we have three different accounts for what forms the basis of samsara and nirvana. Um, and it, it, in general, one finds that uh, Buddha nature tended to be regarded on the one hand as a soteriological basis, but also as a kind of phenomenal basis. It was, it was said to be, and that, that often 
could be frustrating for scholars trying to <laughs> deal with it because uh, the more inclusive basis of all phenomenal existence uh, is a very different type of understanding of Buddha nature than just saying it's a sort of potential within for realizing Buddhahood. So anyways, you find in these works an Atmavadan type account which posits a self that underlies the flux of sentient existence and survives transmigration, such as in the Mahaparinirvana Mahasutra. You have a Tathagarbha account that postulate the Tathagarbha or Tathadatu itself as the basis of Sangsara Nirvana. That's in the Tathagarbha Sutra, the um, and Angulimulia, uh, Amalia, sorry, and the Srimala Shri Devi. And then finally, you have uh, some Yogacara accounts which posit the Alaya, Alaya, Alaya Vijnana as the basis of Sangsara Nirvana and as a repository of latent tendencies for the manifestation of both. Um, so it's clear when you look at Gulitsawa, the passage we saw, that he synthesized key elements of each of these three in presenting Tathagarbha as a subtle self, which he in turn identifies with the Alaya Vijnana. And now that to understand Mikyodorji's critique, it's important that he uh, wants none of this. He, he, he insists on a very firm distinction between Alaya Vijnana and Buddha nature. And uh, that's not at all atypical because many, many uh, Tibetan masters thought it was extremely important to distinguish uh, what is the source of awakened qualities or awakening itself and the source of delusion and uh, ignorance and all of that. So. Um, Almost every tradition, say the Gelukpas, who kind of aborted the whole idea of Alaya Vijnana after Tsongkhapa's early work on the Alaya Vijnana, um, they all turned against it following in Chandrakirti's footsteps. But almost all the other traditions were faced with how to clearly distinguish sources of awakening from sources of delusion. And Alaya Vijnana was thought to do a good job of explaining sources of delusion and conditioned existence, but not a very good job for explaining uh, sources of awakening. So therefore, there were attempts made, like in the Jonang tradition, Yeshe, uh, sorry, uh, Kunji Yeshe, Kunji Namshe, which was picked up by many other scholars, like Shakya Chogden, like that distinction. You have Dagpe Kunji versus Ma Dagpe Kunji in some Kagyu texts. In the Nyingma tradition, you have Dungi Kunji and Kengi Kunji. So you have all these different ways of distinguishing a pure ground. In the case of the Nyingma tradition, they often just went full, full in with a Yeji or Dumeji and distinguished it from all different types of kunshi. Uh, all of the four types usually are mentioned. So that's just to understand that Mikidorje is very much on the side of insisting on a clear distinction between Alaya Vijnana and Buddha nature in order to avoid confusing sources of awakening and delusion in uh, both in theory and practice. So the main objection to Gulatau is, is his acceptance of a view that there is a personal self, which he says is rejected by Buddhists of all stripes. In the embodiments, he said, this doctrine that there's a personal self is not found anywhere in Buddhism from the Kashmiri Vibhashikas up to the proponents of the true Dharma of the Kala Chakra. Again, in the tonic, he says, in general, from Vibhashikas Bi such as the Vatsiputriya up to Vajrayana, there's no option to accept a substantially existing self. I won't read all these quotes because I'll run out of time. So the Madhyama, uh, the, following the Madhyamaka, uh, he also goes on to reject the idea of an indescribable self of the Vatsiputriya and the nominally existent self of the Vibhashikas. So it's a pretty blanket rejection of all sources of self. And then he explains the Madhyamaka position. Though the Madhy Madhyamaka repeats what others say about this nominally existent self as a mere linguistic convention, um, he never ever posits an established personal self as a nominally existent real entity within the tenets of their own system. So this is this loka prasida argument. He says, okay, they go along with speaking about an empirical self just uh, on the level of uh, discursive practices, but they never actually accept any kind of self within their own uh, philosophical system. So he says, if even a merely imputed self is not posited in one's tradition, how is it acceptable to posit many degrees of selfhood, like this is the subtle to coarse gradation, um, distinguished in profundity from coarse to subtle, either generally in the doctrinal system of Buddhists or specifically in the doctrinal system of the Madhyamaka, of the causal and resultant vehicles. In other words, the sutric tantric uh, Madhyamaka. And then he further goes on to repudiate Gulo's claim that the imputed phenomena of a self can be established by valid sources of knowledge on the conventional level. And he says that this is simply copied from Tsongkhapa's Lekshe Ningpo. <laughs> so he doesn't, he's not very approving of that. So 
Um, I won't go too much into these, they're fascinating, but maybe I'll just read a little bit. You accept, he says, you accept anomaly existent coarse self and posit conventionally a subtle self as the substantially existent Talaya Vijnana that is mind. In this regard, you become a proponent of substantially existent persons. But this is precisely what is refuted in the extensive canonical scriptures of the Buddha. And then just to jump to the next quote, even, you know, uh, he, he takes uh, Gulutsawa to task for saying that, um, it's, that his view is nothing like the, those of the Sankhya. He even says the Sankhya are in some ways uh, superior because they did accept that uh, their own ahankara is comprised of the out, outer and inner elements. So it is kind of, they did sort of view it as a composite self in some fashion. Sorry, I'm moving a little quickly, just want to get to the meat. So the in, for Mika Dorje, getting to his more specific critique, he sees the identification of Tathagarbha with a subtle self as involving a kind of unwarranted personification of Tathagarbha, and this is where he thinks the confusion of sources of bondage, i.e. the belief in self with sources of liberation, selflessness, and Tathagarbha um, begins. And he sees there's two sort of um, prongs of this illegitimate personification. One is the idea that Buddha nature is a patient self, in other words, that which undergoes suffering, and an agent self that strives for liberation. And both of these mistaken interpretations he, read, he, he traces back to the Srimala Devi, uh, which in section 13, Gulitsawa had cited as scriptural support for the view that Tathagarbha is a subtle self as Alaya Vijnana that undergoes suffering and strives for liberation. The passage in question reads, Bhagavan, whatever be these six consciousnesses and whatever be this other consciousness, these seven factors are unstable, disconnected, momentary, and do not experience suffering. So rather, it's the Tathagarbha being inseparably connected, not momentary, that does experience suffering. So this is a, it, taken out of context, it's a very provo provocative statement. And let's see what Mikudorji does with that. So, it, on the face of it, it does appear to construe Buddha nature not only as the basis of samsara nirvana, but more dubiously as the very experiencer of suffering, the nyongwapo, that which grows weary of suffering and long searches and prays for nirvana. This uh, prompts the Karmapa to contend that the passage is not scriptural support for the view that Tathagarbha experiences suffering, but is rather an instant where the Bhagavan discusses the Alaya Vijnana using the term Buddha nature in order to graciously take on board mind-only proponents. <laughs> so it's a, a bit of a ruse, a provisional ruse. So the Bhagavan in these cases considered the Alaya Vijnana which experiences suffering to be the aspect of karmic ripening, but he did not consider it to be the aspect of karmic seeds and the like. So in other words, the Alaya Vijnana can help describe how suffering impinges on human consciousness, but it's not, by that we should not infer that it's some kind of a there's some sort of a personification of Buddha nature. Um, so how, how does uh, this Tathagarbha relate to Alaya Vijnana? Um, if we look at the preceding and succeeding lines in that passage, which Mika Dorje draws attention to, we see a different picture. So it says, Bhagavan, if there were no Tathagarbha, there would be no weariness of suffering, nor longing, searching, and praying for nirvana, which we recognize it also occurs in the Ratnagotra Vibhaga in a different form. Then there's the passage in question about the Buddha nature being the experiencer of suffering. But then it goes on to say, the Buddha nature is not a self, it's not a sentient being, it's not a life force, it's not a person. It's not the domain of beings who have succumbed to personalistic views. It's the quintessence of the authentic Dharma Dhatu, Dharmakaya, and trans transmundane qualities. So for Amika Dorje, there's a deeper question here, uh, which is how can the experience of suffering include an awareness of its own limitation and non-inevitability? That's, that's what he thinks this passage is, is uh, really getting at. So this sense that things could be better for him must come from some deeper layer or capacity beneath or beyond the substratum consciousness. And that's why he wants this distinction. It can't, it can't come sort of from the source of all conditioned and uh, deluded experience. So the recognition of such a limitation as a limitation must be based on a criterion that transcends the limit. And this criterion of fulfillment is Tathagarbha considered as a spiritual affiliation or, I like your term affiliation because I've, uh, in English, affiliation works nicely too. It's got that idea of a family uh, nonetheless, I've used potential here, but I, I like the idea. Uh, so 
this leads Mikudorja to say, Buddha nature is certainly not a patient self or an agent self. He says it's in, in admis, inadmissible to claim that Buddha nature is an experiencer of karma and results, that it grows weary of samsara, that it strives for liberation from it. It's inadmissible that it's a sentient being. It's inadmissible that it's a self. It's inadmissible that Tathagarbha is firmly immersed in the states of samsara. So these are all taking apart the quotation we saw. Then he moves on to the prasangas or the absurd consequences that follow from this. If, if Buddha nature was a self and sentient being that's able to be a basis for karma and results, it would absurdly, it would ad absurdly follow that Tathagarbha doctrine gives rise to the view of self adhered to by Buddhist and non-Buddhist extremists. And if a sentient being were Buddha nature, it would absurdly follow either that this Buddha nature would never be liberated from samsara because it would perpetually remain sentient being, or conversely, that for the deluded state of consciousness, samsara would never have existed even conventionally. So he sees this as not being at all evidence that beings experience suffering. It's not a proof from effect or a proof where you can infer a cause from effect. So then we have some further absurdities. Uh, if, if it was possible for Buddha nature to serve as a basis for karma and results, the fallacious consequence would follow that Buddha nature is beset by heat and cold, hunger and thirst. And not only that, but countless other de deleterious effects would transpire, such as the flesh and blood of one Buddha nature becoming food for another Buddha nature. So we have this sort of uh, unpleasant scenario of Buddha nature is uh, sort of going through mutual predation and feeding off one another. And I mean, he loves to do these uh, extended sort of, uh, I won't go further into it just because you can probably guess some of the other absurdities that follow. Um, but I think the point in all this is to show that if, if a term like Buddha nature, a distinction between Buddha nature and Alaya Vishnana is to have any weight, it has to um, maintain the it, distinction for which it was intended, which is to distinguish sources of delusion from sources of awakening. He's very much a, a kind of a language philosopher when it comes to this stuff. He says, in the same way that we, do, we want to be very clear when we label poison and medicine, you don't want to sort of just sort of fudge the boundary between these, or it could be, you know, have disastrous effects. So what does he mean then but on the other side of this, and I won't have a lot of time, but what does he mean by this transcendent selfhood? Well, we, we can look at how he understands that, you know, in the, in the Ratnagotra Vipaga, um, this idea that uh, of purity, permanence, joy, and authentic, authentic selfhood, when he defines what authentic selfhood means, in short, Ultimate purity means total purity because of its general and specific natures and its being immaculate. Being free from self and no self is the meaning of authentic selfhood. Um, so he, and he takes the term uh, paral to chinpa to mean both perfection but also transcendence as the Tibetan rendering of uh, paramita already conveys. So it's a kind of going beyond self and no self. And, and when he looks at the tantras, this idea of purification of self, he takes to mean purified of self, and not, not that your self becomes more and more pure, because he says if you accept that, then you may as well just be a atma vadan sitting, you know, a yogin who sits there and meditates on their pure inner self. He says, no, it means uh, purified of self. Um, so he says, when the so-called purification of self, which needs to be explained in the sense of selflessness, is instead explained according to a belief in self, it absurdly follows that one inevitably explains the vital pr principle of the creation stages in a perverted way. So, so I'll just conclude by, uh, there's an interesting, when he takes up, sorry, when he takes up uh, Gulutsawa's claim that the tantras talk about this uh, um, Mahapurusha Pudgala, um, what Mikidorje says, well, what do we mean by that? He, he says that uh, in the mind streams of those who see Buddha nature, thoughts of cells and of phenomena and persons do not arise at all. So how could there be something like a great self? So he says, well, when they use terms like that, they, they, we have to apply the same nominalist uh, critique that you find in the conception of a self that uh, it's a myriological argument where it's part and whole. So we have a collection, a bundle of Buddha qualities, but they're not anchored in any enduring singular self-sufficient principle at all. So he describes it as a collection universal. So a great man, he says, is only a designation for the qualities of the re referent of the designation. 
Buddha endowed with all the major and minor marks and all the rest. So for him, one can acknowledge Buddha qualities without a, however accepting that there exists a singular permanent self-sufficient core of selfhood to anchor them. And so just to conclude, he says, if it's impossible for anyone to say there's a person who's a great man apart from these discrete or different qualities such as major or minor marks, then what is more illogical than postulating a self as the agent or creator, Jepapo, uh, of the designated qualities of all who are the reference of the designation, that is, the Mahapurusha of the Mantrayana. Thank you. <laughs> Rush to the finish line. Well, David, thank you very much for this great job of translating and analyzing the Nanopony. But uh, there is uh, like a one thing, you know, like, I mean, uh, we have no evidence that Gurusama ever postulated uh, a subtle cell. Yeah, and this is. We don't have the views of Sanwa. Right, right. And this uh, is the problem. This huge, yeah. huge uh, Dhamma commentary mm -hmm. uh, where he should like raise the topic, you know, because this is uh, the context. You don't find mm -hmm. you know, the term of Sanwa. No, it's. Uh, it's, and, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's. Yeah. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in his new Lama commentary, uh, he is quoting a lot of tantras mm -hmm. also, so you could not argue mm -hmm. that this is a non-tantric and we still have to wait for his tantric. Uh, right, right. Uh, like uh, when he gives mm -hmm. an etymology of uh, the new Lama, he even uh, quotes tantras, you know, and this is kind of a right, of right. and so mm -hmm. on. So uh, I just wanted to inform you of the topic that Oh yeah, no, I, <laughs> no, I, I sort of made the disclaimer that uh, we don't have access to the work, but his, his quotations have, we found to be extremely reliable. So taking this one quotation, I think, and also the, um, his Ratna Gotravibhaga commentary was a later work in which he may have also toned down some of his subtle self-talk. Yeah. For the time being, I suggest, you know, mm -hmm. to, to take issue with Jitsundaba and not Guru. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I'm actually a bit sympathetic to Jade Tsongkhapa. I like his uh, view of subtle self. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's well taken. Yeah. I have a question that's pedantic, <laughs> tangential, so I apologize for that. But uh, when you, the Samkhya, you mentioned the, the five qualities of the Samkhya self. Mm -hmm. um, I, and then you had it in hard brackets like material constituents. I was wondering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it not the, the Purusha, like, the five, like not the creator, but the enjoyer, and so these five right, right. qualities, but then later you, you mentioned the Ahamkara, that that was the self that was being identified. So I'm yeah, that's more about how he's, he's depicting the Samkhya self. Yeah, he takes a, 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 I think it's a Narzin for Ahamkara, but he, he takes it their view of, I mean, it was kind of a very tangential remark for him to make too. He was just saying that, okay, Gulitzawa, you're saying that um, this view is our, our my own subtle self view is in no way um, comparable to the Sankhya view of a uh, self and and of course Mukidorje being the um, sort of uh, critic he is so it turns it on him and says actually it's worse <laughs> your view is worse because at least the Sankhya recognizes the Ahankara to be made up of these different uh, external and internal elements so it's just a kind of a an additional Affrontery, if you like. It's so self notion rather than self. It's yeah, self yeah. Self it's just, yeah, part of just this kind of critique. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Found the long conversation, but um, in his period, is mm -hmm. he actively trying to use Buddha nature to mm -hmm. um, provide a basis for a subtle body in the way that Ranjan Gorge did in the first chapter of the Samanandha commentaries? Um, that I'm not too familiar with, but what we found in his Kusum Motra Namshe is that he thinks that in, in the non-tantric discussions of Buddha nature, he describes it as merely a, a vague indication of Buddha nature that the tantras don't provide a way to realize it through praxis of any kind, whereas in, in the tantras it gives you all of the full, what he describes as the full um, complexity of Buddha nature and how to put it into practice. So he, he makes an interesting kind of comparison between sutric and tantric accounts. Um, but yeah, how much he goes into the 
the sort of Zabmo Nungdun material. Unfortunately, he refers to it a lot, but he didn't ever write a commentary. There were something like 13 commentaries, but mm -hmm. none, bu none from him. But it was a very important source for him nonetheless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, following on what Klaus raised, I mean, could there be a uh, personal or institutional reason why, uh, why the Kramapa would go after Kolosawa? I mean, would they I don't think so. That like during this whole period, like late 14th century onward, there's kind of like a, a bit of an uprising against the Gelugpa, and uh, I think uh, they unfairly target Tsongkhapa, who I think preceded a lot of the sort of more polemical um, intersectarian polemics that went on with his his immediate disciples and others. But there's almost a um, an unhealthy um, preoccupation with the Gelugpa is getting many things wrong. And, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I find the Tsongkhapa was a very, um, you know, he, he, I think he brought, shed new light on all sorts of topics, including this idea of a subtle self, being able to accept some idea of an empirical self as a valid object for conventional pramanas and so forth. And uh, so I'm kind of sympathetic to it, but I think you have to look at what each of them are trying to do. Tsongkhap is trying to stake out a, a legitimate area for discussing. I think for Miki Dorje, it would make more sense to just talk about persons in that way. He's okay with talking about persons in conventional terms. He just thinks when you come to self that it's too loaded and uh, you know, it's too much part of Buddhist doctrine to just reject self of any, any kind, however coarse or however subtle. So, um, yeah, I, th I, th I think that uh, one needs to kind of look at what, how, how their discussions of self fit into their overall understanding of, of um, you know, um, objects of investigation. And for Mika Dorji, he just thinks you shouldn't accept any idea of self, even conventionally. So he's a bit strong on that, on that front. Yeah. Yes? Uh, at the beginning, when you, when you mentioned uh, Kalpiora, not really. I think they, uh, uh, because the they had different uh, sources and different uh, key figures. Like for for Mikidorji and many other um, adherents of Prasangika, Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and um, and Shanti Deva. And there's a line of Madhyamaka thinkers who fit into that. Whereas for the Raptimi Nepa, it's more like a Mantrayana Madhyamaka. A tradition that that Maitripa and his circle are the main proponents of, and the Siddhas. Um, so it's slightly different lineages, but what they're actually saying in terms of um, how we should regard all phenomena are quite similar. The the Raptuminepa or the Apatistana Vadans say that uh, all phenomena lack any epistemic or ontological foundation. And um, much the same is said from the Prasangika point of view that all phenomena lack any enduring essence, be it mental or, or material. So Does that go against the use of logic in the way that Tsongkhapa uses it? Uh, you mean again? I mean, the anti foundationalist idea. Yeah, Tsongkhapa wasn't a fan of the Raptumineva tradition. <laughs> um, not sure exactly why, because it fits in with his own anti-essentialism to some extent, but maybe he just had his reservations about that lineage or something. Um, maybe somebody else knows more about Tsongkhapa's reticence toward the Apatistana. He picked it up from Chapa Chuki Senge, you know, his re, re He didn't acknowledge the re relevance of the distinction, even though it was an Indian distinction, whereas Prasangika was a Tibetan invention, but he, yeah. That's just, yeah. I think it had to do with sources and, and uh, figures that he, he probably didn't accept as warmly as, as he would Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and Shantideva. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a sense of that, Dorje? Uh, like why he, well, why uh, Tsongkhapa didn't really like this distinction between Mayapamavada uh, and uh, Pratistana? I personally think that it's mm -hmm. mainly because uh, uh -huh. people who follow more than mm -hmm. uh, I think more than is the first uh, mm -hmm. critique. Right. I mean, the first scholar, Tibetan scholar to write a critique on mm -hmm. this distinction. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is, he said, put it there, mm -hmm. it's just to plead the fools or 
<laughs> but uh, later on, I really suspect that actually he was not criticizing Tibetans, but I think he was criticizing even Indians. The Maitripa tradition. Mm -hmm. was not aware because he said, you should not say that he's, too, he's a fool because we have Indian sources. But mm -hmm. I suspect uh -huh. that Mohammed Shira was actually criticizing the Indian sources. Oh, OK. <laughs> but this, of course, not obvious. Yeah. So uh, Kanu-san has already published this article. Mm -hmm. By the way, only in Japanese, no? Uh, your article on oh, Mohamed Shara's <laughs> technique. Oh, OK. Interesting. Where I think it's the first literature to teach uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, We should also consider that for some kind of ultimate realization is uh, still informed uh, by uh, assessment, Yongchul. Mm -hmm. And uh, that yeah. somehow doesn't go very well, you know, like it's not a binding, like, uh, which is one of the meaning. Oh, I see. Yeah. That there's still a uh, role for. Yeah. Another mm -hmm. thing we have to think about. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you.